Take 15. God, it's been a long time since I've done this. Hello everybody, it's the War Hipster here, coming at you with another Painting Techniques video. We've done a couple of these in the past, not very many, but this is one that a number of you have been asking for for a very long time. So what we're going to be doing in this video is we're going to be covering a couple of things. Firstly, we're going to be looking at brush control and how to hold your paintbrush, because this does answer a lot of questions that I think a lot of you have. For various different things such as you know getting to hard to reach areas and edge highlighting and stuff like that so we'll be doing a whole lot of stuff about brush control we're then going to be looking at how to thin down paints and how to mix paints or at least how i do it and what the explanation of the terminology that i use is i.e two parts to one part basically how that works and then i'm also going to show you a couple of little extra techniques and tips on how to edge highlight your models using a very very large space marine see what i mean it's a very large space marine for the emperor <laughs> so yes we're going to be covering all of that and i'll check in with you after we've got through each part and this is just really to help you level up your painting game and paint more like me if that's something that you want to do and if you'd like to see the other video that we've done on painting techniques, you can check out this video on how to paint with contrast paints. It's one of my most popular videos today, and I really like it being at the top there. So go watch that one as well. I've got you covered. And as always, before we jump into the video, please do make sure you leave a like if you like it. If you don't like it, leave a dislike. I mean, nobody else will know, but I will. And that's really what it's all about, right? And if you do like or dislike this video, please do subscribe. It really helps the channel and it is a free way to support me. And we're so close to 40,000 subscribers now. I can almost taste it. 40k for 10th edition 40k. So without further ado, let's jump in for tips for brush control. It's a slightly weird shot. Okay. You can't see my face, but there is a reason. So when it comes to brush control, one of the things that I see some people do is they try to paint like this. So they will have the model in their hands like this, and they will hold the model like this with a floating elbow and their brush will then be another floating elbow. And if you've got really, really strong wrist control and elbow control, then this can work for you. However, most of us don't have that. So one of the most important things when it comes to learning about brush control is you need to anchor yourself. And this is where we have the weird shot, right? So I have a chair with arms and this is so that I can anchor my elbows here. So I don't have to use any kind of effort to hold my arms up and this, it just makes things a little bit easier. So now the steadiness has to come from my wrists and my hands rather than up like this. You see, makes sense. The another thing you can do is you see the edge of the desk here. You can pull yourself in a little bit tighter to the desk. So you can anchor your elbow here, anchor your elbow on this arm as well. And then you can anchor your arm on the actual desk itself. So you can see we've got touching just here and we can do that as well. So we can hold our model like this. And we can hold our brush like that. Now my hands will be much steadier. As you can see, just by sheer dint of holding them like that. So always, when you're painting, anchor your elbows. And if you can, anchor your arms as well. If you want to anchor your wrists, you can. Sometimes for really tiny detail work, you can come like this. So when you see my, my wrist here, it's touching the desk. This gives you 
You're just not using any strength or any kind of endurance or stamina in order to hold the model. You just, it's just nice and simple. That's the first part of brush control. It'll help you get a lot closer to being able to have steadier hands and it'll help you get to those more difficult places and it'll help you with your edge highlighting. With our elbows and our forearms anchored, my hands now feel nice and steady. But now we need to talk about, again, it's another kind of simple tip or trick for your brush control needs and for in painting for long periods of time is about natural hand position. So one thing I would encourage you to do is just whilst you're at home now, just take your palm of your hand and lay it flat on the table or any kind of flat surface that you have and stretch it out like that. You see, this is not a natural position for your hand to be. Now what you want to do is relax the hand by just lifting it up and just placing it on the table. And that is the most relaxed position for your hand to be in, you see? So you want to try and replicate this, particularly with your painting hand, because this is gonna be the one that kind of is more destined to get kind of more kind of strain on the wrist and on the fingers and is kind of one that you'll have if it's your dominant hand you'll have a greater sense of hand-eye coordination for it so there is the most relaxed position for my hand if i just lift it up again once more there we go my fingers are all curled over like this but my index finger sticks out it's just sort of lots of lots of Lots of painting has kind of changed the natural position of my hand because if I do the same thing with both hands, this one's a lot more curled over than this one. So there's again, there's my natural, natural resting positions for my hands. So the reason that's important is when it comes to painting your miniatures, you want the most relaxed position for your hand. So if I just hold my brush, in my relaxed position, like that, as you can see. It's pretty standard in terms of the way it looks for paint. Now, the other thing about your brush is remember that your brush kind of is the best way it works in your hand is the way that you were taught to write with. So I hold my pen like this, and then I write my words and letters this way so i hold my brush like this so often you'll see in my videos i'll be painting either like this or like that particularly when it comes to doing kind of more fine detail work and again a natural position and the way that you're holding your brush and in terms of the kind of comfortable nature of the way that you're holding your brush this all does pay into brush control but also endurance when it comes to painting and it will help you with things like edge highlighting, shading, recess shading, and even applying base coats. So another part of this is when we were talking about bracing our elbows, my elbows are currently still braced on the arms of my chair, as are my forearms. You can't see them in this shot, but if I'm kind of doing more kind of lax work, I might just do something like this, but I am more inclined to paint in this way, keeping the brush nice and firmly gripped between th three fingers so I'm not like gripping it tight but having those three fingers there keeps a nice range of movement like this all the movement is in the thumb and in the kind of joint here in the fingers rather than like this kind of thing you don't want your fingers to be too stiff as you're using the brush you want a nice relaxed grip on the brush but anchored nicely between three fingers like that so this is not going anywhere unless you put it out that way <laughs> but otherwise it's not really going anywhere if i press on it from any direction because i've got it nice and secure there you go. So holding the brush is important. So I would just look at how you're holding your brush. Pick up your brush in a way that you would naturally paint. So don't think about it too much. Just grab your brush and then get it into paint, painting position and then just see if it looks similar to mine. This might not be a comfortable hold for you, but this is how I hold my brush. 
Um, I have seen people who paint like this, and that can be comfortable for them, but it's quite restricted in its movement. It's all wrist there. You want more fingers when it comes to using your brush. So you don't want kind of that type of thing. I have seen people who paint like this, which again is all wrist. So you can't get as much precision out of a wrist and you end up having to use your elbow. So you end up with that floating elbow, which means you lose precision because you're no longer anchored on this arm. So you just use full body movement there. Whereas if you've got it nice and anchored, like so, just using the fingers. Now I have also seen this kind of hold. I've seen this kind of hold. And I've even seen this kind of hold. However it is comfortable for you, this I have found is the best way because it's how I write with my pen. It's also how I hold a plectrum that way. So make sure, just, just look at how you're holding your brush and see if that's one of the things that's holding you back in terms of your brush control. We've talked a lot about the hand holding the brush, but there is another hand involved, and that is the one that holds the model. Now, again, this is about natural holding position. But remember, you're going for precision, right? When you're doing things like edge highlighting and stuff like that. So the way you hold your model is important. Now, if we were to, say, pick up this Praetor, sent to me by Mr. Gloom Spike Noob. Thank you very much, sir. If I was to hold this model as it is, that's a fairly comfortable position to hold a model, but it's not very sturdy because if I'm moving it, it's going to eventually start to rotate all the way around to the point of where it will eventually, there you go, my thumb has caught it, right? So a lot of the time people tend to hold a model like this, but now my wrist is in this position and my arm is no longer braced on the desk. So I'm holding the model like this in order to kind of have a really decent, good kind of, at least from your perspective, as you can see, but this is how I paint normally when I'm not on the camera. So I like to hold the model this way in this orientation. Now, a natural position, if I was to brace it, would mean that I would paint everything in this kind of orientation, which is not ideal because you're not getting the best kind of look at what the light looks like, but also it just doesn't look very nice as you're painting to go across the model this way, especially if you're using something like contrast paints where you can end up sometimes with tide marks or you can actually see the direction in which the paint was applied to the model. Holding your model this way because it's comfortable means all of your lines and brush strokes are going to be from top to bottom. So that's when you end up having to hold it like this. And again, this is a little bit more comfortable, but it's not very sturdy. So any kind of, particularly if you're doing something like dry brushing, you might find that if you're going to use a dry brush, see how much movement there is in that model. But you might even find that what can happen is as you're doing it, this finger here is now touching the back of the cloak. And that's where you can start to rub paint off unexpectedly. Or indeed, if it's wet, you're gonna get paint on your finger and then you're gonna get a fingerprint in the paint. So this is why I would always recommend picking up a painting handle. Now there's many, many brands available. I like the old Citadel painting handles, not the new one. The Version two is a little bit too thin for my hands. I like this one because it's got satisfying weight to it, satisfying um, kind of heft to it and weight. And it holds the model nice and securely. And it means I can sit with my model in that comfortable position like this, and I can just hold it straight up in that fashion rather than as demonstrated before, holding it like that. So being able to hold it this way up is good. This is quite stiff. This is a reasonably new painting handle. Um, but yeah, there's tons and tons of brands out there, but I would absolutely recommend picking one up. And even if you don't want to pick up a painting handle, you can always use stuff like former pot, pots of paint. So 
so that you could grab a pot of paint here and just like put a large clump of blue tack on the top there and you just stick the model down to it and then you can paint in the same way it just means you get a little bit more comfortable as you're holding your models which is very very important for those long painting sessions so with our arms anchored our model held in a comfortable way and our brush ready with some paint on it when it comes to brush control here's a really important thing so if you think of that same kind of liken likening to writing with a pen or paper pen and paper not pen or paper well i guess you can do pen or paper anyway when you're writing with a pen and paper what you want to do is you want to do brush strokes that are familiar to you you don't want to do brush strokes that don't make any sense and you also want to make keep in mind that you can only paint accurately what you can see accurately and what i mean by this is i think one of the traps that people fall into is that they generally tend to like kind of just paint around the model like this so they lose the precision with their painting hand but they're holding the model still like this and this is incorrect what you want to do is you want to move the model and that's one of the great advantages of using something like a painting handle is that you can do this so you want to keep your painting hand as steady as you can in a comfortable position and this is how you kind of gain more precision and you always want to paint in a way that's familiar to you with writing so this is mostly going to be downward strokes so this is towards you so painting in this leg for example we're going to paint it in like that And that was pretty easy. The least, the next most controllable, although losing control, is to start painting away from you. And this is kind of the second stroke that you would use most when writing. Ooh, just did some downward strokes there. And that's pretty precise go sideways there can't help it but it wasn't as comfortable as going down towards myself now trying to do this in an unnatural position so for example trying to get in here like this i've now got a floating hand and immediately you can see i've splodged it just there i know that's kind of an exaggerated example but I can't really see this now. So I would have to get under here. If I was gonna hold this like this. And if I was gonna do that, I'm gonna have to come around here to get to the gorget. I'm gonna have to angle the brush, which is not very accurate, which means I'm gonna end up splodging it all over the inside of that little bit of cloak. So what you want to do is you want to move the model with you. And I know that sounds like I'm kind of teaching you to suck eggs, but as you can see, and I'm sure if some of you have struggled with this in the past, those ways that I was just doing that, that will look familiar to some of you. So what you want to do is you want to move the model and orient it in a way that makes it most comfortable for you to be able to see everything that you need in order to paint it. So now I can get at all of this area I'm using those downward strokes again and get this all over start work on the back of the leg and then sometimes there's areas that you can't quite see, but you do just need to orient the model in such a way that you can. And it's only then that you kind of use one of those silly brush strokes. But from here, if I want to get the inside of that leg, I can come in from this direction here. And I've still got my comfortable handhold, although it's not as obvious on the camera. I can still get in there 
and still get at those details. Now, when it comes to doing areas at the top here, it might seem like painting down into the cloak is better than painting up onto the face because you might not like painting faces. But if you orient the model like this, because you've got as much control as you have by having your hands anchored and you're in that comfortable pen writing position, you can just get in there. So you always want to, this hand, as you notice, it's kind of staying in the same place. And I'm anchoring with my little finger here because my other hand is on the desk. So that's a steady platform for it to be on. So I'm using my little fingers to apply a little bit more stability as I apply the paint. Now I'm going to go turn the model back over to apply it just there across that little section like so. So I'm moving the model, not my painting hand. My painting hand is staying in pretty much the same position adding more anchoring as and when I need it. But generally, keeping my hands nice and steady by having it just, everything's just resting on something. So all of the painting is done like this. And this will go a long way towards steadying your brush hand improving the levels of precision. The next thing to talk about when it comes to brush control is actually the parts of the brush. And we're particularly gonna focus on the bristles here. And this is a medium shade brush from Citadel. And it's, you know, it's a decent size without being too big as to make the point too obvious. Although I do have this as well, being a medium scenery brush, but Regardless of what brush you're using, the point will stand, apart from dry brushes. These are these kind of round, round tip brushes. And these are the things that you're gonna spend most of your time miniature painting with, aside from dry brushes. So, when we're talking about brush control, you have to remember that on your bristles, the bristles are the part that are gonna be making contact with the model. Now, when they're making contact with the model, it means every single part of this is involved when it comes to applying paint to a miniature. So if you have paint on the tip, it's going to go onto the mo model. If you have paint around about a third of the way, it's now going to be paint that can be applied to a model. If you have paint that's all the way up to the kind of to the this part, I can't remember what it's called, it'll come to me in a minute. If you have it all the way up to there, then it is at risk of paint going onto the model. So when you are applying your paint, you want to make sure that you don't have paint all the way up, depending on how precise you're being. If you're applying a single color that's all over, say, Space Marine, it doesn't really matter. So for example, if we were painting this Lieutenant again, it doesn't really matter because we're getting red all over this section. But when it comes to painting the black, if I have black all over up to the this bit, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to come to me. Um, then when I'm applying this, I have to be conscious of everywhere up to here that that paint's not going to get everywhere. And this is particularly important when you're trying to get to hard to reach areas. So using a slightly smaller brush in here is where I would call a slightly difficult, hard to reach area. Getting right in to that section just there between the holster here and the belt. Now these are the same color, black and black, but we have red just here. Now I only, when I'm painting it, only want to get the black in this section. I don't want to get it on here. Now I want to keep my paint probably towards about the top quarter of the brush. So maybe we use our bigger example, about that much of the paint of the bristles should have paint on them up to around about there because any more than that and i run the risk of if i put my brush here i run the risk of getting paint 
on the underside of the chest plate and on that thigh plate. And I run the risk of getting it on the belt buckle as well. So the brush stroke here is if I'm holding the model like that sort of thing. I'm gonna get my brush in here. The brush stroke I'm gonna make is up to there like that. Or rather I'm gonna drop my black in there then I'm gonna reorient the model and come in here. Now I'm gonna reorient the model again and come in here like that. So if I have too much paint on my brush, and by too much paint I mean too much of the brush is covered in paint, I have to be wary of all of those areas around there. Similarly goes for under here. I'm trying to get in under there with my paint. I only want sort of the top quarter again to be covered in the paint because if it's all the way down to the this bit, <laughs> we're gonna end up having to worry about sort of half of the brush and it's gonna get on that kind of hamstring. It's gonna get on there. It's gonna get on there. So I just want the tip of my brush to be covered in paint as I apply this. So in this example here, if we want to apply Black Legion up here, up in this corner, as you can see, if I pop my tip of my brush right in there, which is kind of the top of where that Black Legion is going to be, you can see that the bristles are very, very close to the cloak, just there. So if I just do that a little bit, they start to touch the cloak. So what you want is you don't want the paint all the way up to the ferrule, is what it's called, see? I knew it would come to me. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to take that Black Legion and we're going to apply it up to around about there. And there's got a little bit of a drip forming there, as we've talked about in the past with our contrast paint, we don't want that. Now if I come back in here, you can see that the paint goes way past where the cloak is. And that's exactly what we want. So we can control this nicely. We can apply the Black Legion in there like that. Now I'm just going to orientate the more model around so I can get the Black Legion on there. And as you can see, the more I kind of start to move it around, the closer I get to touching the cloak with the bristles with the paint on. So I'm gonna grab a little bit more paint. Then I'm gonna orient the model ever so slightly rather than moving my brush like this, I'm actually just gonna move the model just a little bit. And that gives me access to that little patch just in there. So remember guys, always brace your arms, brace your elbows, brace your wrists, brace your forearms, brace your fingers if you can. This will go a long way to helping you paint your miniatures instead of the floating arm attempt to paint. Because it's never going to go well for you. Unless it does go really well for you, in which case do tell me I'm wrong. That discord noise was perfectly timed. So remember, brace your arms, elbows, whatever you need to brace. Make sure you're holding your arms and wrists comfortably, paint towards you or away from you in a push and always reorientate the model rather than your brush hand. I can tell you right now, this will improve your painting game by like 100% if you don't already do it. If you do already do it, then skip over to the next bit. Next up, let's talk about thinning down paint. Now, often what you'll hear is you want to thin down some paint with a little bit of water, and it's often not entirely clear what that means. So what this little bit of the video is going to show you is exactly how you do that. So what we're going to do is we're going to pick a paint at random, and I'm gonna use Cantor Blue here. I'm gonna give it a good shake. So here is Cantor Blue. We're zoomed right in, as you can see, so. What we're going to do is going to open up this pot of paint and we're going to take a medium layers brush amount, so around about that sort of amount, and we're going to pop it down here on our palette like that, and we're just going to turn, turn the brush until we've got it all on there. Now, I'm going to wash my brush, but I'm not going to thin it down just yet. So, the reason why we thin down the paint is that if I now pass my brush through the blue, what you'll see 
is that there will be a tide mark that comes through it. So if I do this, see that line? See how it's not moving back together very fast? It is kind of in the middle because that was quite a gentle, narrow brush stroke. But if we go again through, say, just here, you can see we created this sort of canyon of blue. If we do this again with some Zandri dust, so just grab some Zandri dust and pop that next to the white just there. Not white, that's blue. Again, no water on the brush. And what we're going to do is just going to pass the brush right through it. So again, I'll just move it like that. Pass the brush like that. So you see how we've got this kind of build up of paint on this side, build up of paint on this side, and there is a complete gap just there, and there's one there, and it's very slowly filling together. And this is not what you want from your Sims Down paint which is why you thin it down. So I'm going to take another blob of Zandri dust. I'm going to pop that next to this one just here. Now what we're going to do is we're going to touch our brush into the water and we're going to apply this in a circular motion over the top of the Zandri dust. Again, just rotating the brush through it to make sure we get it all on there. So we've got a nice consistent blob. And now, when I pass my brush through it, you should see that it will start to come together a lot quicker. If we do the same thing over here, so there's actually not enough water in that Zandri dust, so we're just going to add a touch more. So we're going to, again, go and grab another little brushful like that wash the brush and now I'm going to pass my brush through it and there you go you see how it just immediately swallows that up that means that this paint is now thin enough with which to work see how it just reconstitutes so again over here in our blue, if I just pass my brush through it. That will stay there. However, if I now add a brush load of water to it, and then I pass my brush through it, not quite there. Just going to add a little, about half a brush more. Wash the brush. Pass my brush through it. So it starts to come together, but it's not quite there. It's going to add just a touch more. This is paint that's been out for a little bit longer than the Zandri dust. Pass my brush through it. There we go. See how it starts to reconstitute together. There we go. And that's how you thin down your paints with water. Quite often in my videos, you'll see me say things like two parts flesh terrors red to one part contrast medium or two parts contrast medium to one part flesh terrors red. And how this is done is what I'm going to show you next. So the parts basically equate to brush loads. So when I say two parts contrast medium, it's two brush loads of contrast medium to one brush load of flesh terrors red. Now I would recommend having a brush to do this a specific brush, but often that's not enough time for me to do that. Now I do have one here. It's a medium layer brush. 
there, it's quite ratty. And I do tend to use this from time to time when I'm kind of thinning down paints like these ones here before me. But when it comes to these ones, you generally want to do it with a similar size to what you're actually going to be applying the paint to the model with. And as I use a medium layer brush and a small layer brush most of the time, that's generally how I would do things. Now, in order to do those mixes, what we want to do is we want to get really good brush loads. So we're not looking to just get like tip of the brush. We want to get a rather large, rather large dollop of it like that one there. And we're going to pop one brush load there and then we're going to grab another brush load and pop it just there. Then we're going to wash the brush in between so we don't contaminate either of our pots. And then we're going to get another similar size brush load of, in this case, Slash Terra's Red. And we're just going to apply this and mix it in to the pot of paint. Not pot of paint, to the puddle that we've just created. And that's how you mix a paint, like that. Now, if it's not quite thin enough, what you can then do, for example, this is how I determine quite a lot of my thinned down mixtures. It's just grab another brush load of your thinner, like that, and then next to it, you just want to apply it to see what it looks like. And then you want to mix it into the rest of the mixture, like that. You see it's nearly there. If we wanted to do, for example, a really red glaze, wash the brush, grab another brush load, and then next to it again, we then mix it in like that. And so now if I apply this to my finger, it should look closer to that than it does to the rest of it. There you go. You see? Perfect. And that's what I mean by mixing paints. It's brush loads of the parts, and that's how we put things together. Now the thing about contrast medium is that it is of course a contrast paint without any colored pigment in it. So it gives you more contrast the more you use it, which is why it's often the best thing to thin down contrast to keep that contrast effect. However, sometimes you might want to thin something down just so that you get a kind of more of it and it is slightly easier to apply. And in that case, it might be best for you if you prefer to paint in a kind of more liquidy state rather than a more contrasty state. And contrast does have a little bit of solidity to it. So it kind of has a bit more of this if I pass my brush through it like that. It does have the ability to create those time marks. And that's only been drying for another 10 seconds after I started this take. take. Well, 59 seconds. So what you can do is you can use slightly different thinners. Now they might not keep the contrast effect as well, but what they will do is they will give you a little bit more kind of of the paint and it will thin it down in the way that you want. So this is where you can use something like Lamia Medium. Now Lamia Medium is a lot more liquidy than contrast medium. This is a lot more kind of solid than this one. So if we pull some more Flesh Terrors Red, from a pot and we use some Lamia medium instead. So let's grab that Flesh Terra's Red. So we're gonna go one part Flesh Terra's Red. And then we're gonna go for a second part of Flesh Terra's Red just so we've got enough on the palette to prove the point. There we go. If I pass my brush through it in the way that we have been doing, you should see a line like this one. So here we go. It starts to reconstitute, but you can see where it started to dry at the edge. You do have that line. Now, if we use Lamia Medium, so we're gonna go one, and then we're gonna pop another one next to it. So we've got a similar amount. We're gonna mix these two together. leave it to dry for five more seconds. 
that was 10 seconds. What we're then going to do is pass our brush through it. As you can see, we do have a little bit of a line going on, but it reconstitutes much quicker than it would over here, for example. So if I do it to our thinnest part, which is just here, we have that line going on. Do it here again. As you can see, it's much more consistent at sticking around. And this goes the same for most of these kind of slightly more liquid thinners because they are designed to thin all paints, albeit some more effectively than others, than contrast does, contrast medium. But contrast medium is specifically designed to thin down contrast paint to retain more of that contrast effect. The more you add to it, it will still keep doing the contrasting thing. So this is where we can use, like, for example, an alternative brand, for example, and we can grab a brush load of Flesh Terrors Red. And then we can use something like Water Plus from Instar Paints. And we just add one blob of that. You can thin it down and you can see it's much more liquidy, much like the Lamy and Medium was. I wash my brush. I can pass my brush through it. And as you can see, it reconstitutes very quickly, just like the Lamy and Medium does, because these have now kind of taken some of that contrast element away in that contrast paint has those kind of two pigments in it, the heavier and the lighter but you will lose some of that kind of stark contrasting effect and you will lose some of that pull as it kind of pulls back from, from the edges to create that faux highlight that contrast paints and indeed all one coat paint solutions tend to do. Of course, in an ideal world, you would always use a medium to thin all paint, but that's not really monetarily possible. But if we grab some Calador Sky here and pop that on the palette, and this being another base colour, we give that brush a wash. We pass our brush through it. Here we go. There's our clear gap, there's our two paint mountains on either side of the valley. If we then grab a brush load of Lamy and Medium, for example, this thins the paint perfectly. And you use less of it than you would say water. So if I then pass my brush through it, as you can see, reconstitutes very, very quickly. There you go. And the line is gone. So it's really up to you. Water is cheap and free-ish um, and is very good for thinning down base and layer paints. It's not so good for thinning down contrast paints because you lose all of the contrasting nature and you can sometimes see that the pigments will separate, whereas something like Lamia Medium will thin them down and mix them together to make more of a kind of less contrasty paint. And Contrast Medium will thin both different pigments in contrast paints at the same time to create a thinner contrast paint, a different color over here. So there's lots of different options, but I would generally steer away from using water for contrast paint because it doesn't do very nice things to it. It does create this kind of tea staining that you can generally tend to get. And the ones that are not contrast mediums, as you can see, this one, there's a lot less of a line around the outside where it's drying in my hot room. Whereas here you can absolutely see that harsh line. This was the water plus and on the Lamia medium again, you can also see this harsh line here when you use these things. This is what I mean is that it's creating those, mixing those pigments together to create a sort of slightly different, less contrasty paint, but more efficient to use. But if you were to use this to kind of do half a model and then start again, you're gonna get some very, very harsh transition lines on, for example, let's say you're painting a space marine and you do half his leg and come back later. It's less pronounced over here, as you can see around the outside 
than it is on these ones. And water does this, normal water on its own with contrast paint, does this, but to a greater effect, which is why I would generally steer away from it. But there you go, mixing and thinning paints. So there you go, thinning and mixing paints. Essentially with your base and layer paints, remember what you want to do is you want to add enough water so that you don't leave those two cavernous valleys of paint on either side. This is what I refer to, and I think is what most people refer to as a tide mark. So you wanna make sure that that paint on your palette reconstitutes into a nice consistent pile. And when it comes to mixing your paints and thinning them down with contrast medium, as we explained, you want to make sure that you keep those two piles separate, get those colors on one by one, and then mix them together in a circular motion until they are fully mixed. And remember, you can use any type of thinner that you wish, including water, but for contrast paints, I would avoid using water almost entirely. There are payoffs to doing contrast medium versus other mediums, but there are also benefits and there are cons to doing either. So your choice is yours, of course, but Bear that in mind for all your future thinning endeavours. Now, given everything we've talked about in terms of brush control and thinning your paints and all this kind of thing, we're going to finish this video off by talking about edge highlighting. Now, a lot of you asked me for tips on how to edge highlight, and, well, I figured the best way to do this was to use this McFarlane toy, this Raven Guard, here and a large brush so that you can really see how this works in principle. Now this is with one of the kind of pre-painted ones and it's got all of the things that we need in order to demonstrate this. So when it comes to edge highlighting one of the best things that you can do is you can always look for edges that are kind of ones that don't have anything behind them. They're kind of edge of the piece of armor so for example we got this one here on the foot and this one here around the top of the knee and then we have other edges inside where you need to do slightly different edge highlighting such as this one just here around the bottom so you know you get these types of things on on, on space marines all the time and you have the same thing over here on this leg so you've got this one here where you've got that outward facing edge then you've got these inside facing edges as well so when it comes to painting those outside edges, what you want to do is you want to, again, load up your brush, but you don't want to get the entire of the brush covered in paint. You only want to do around about the top quarter of it. And then what you want to do is you want to, on, for example, this leg here, this is an outward facing detail. You want to go past the detail, and then you want to do those brush strokes towards yourself like this so you get the most control out of the brush stroke and the same thing coming down here I'm using administratum grey it's a nice stark highlight here as you can see, I'm past the, the edge at all times, but if I have too much paint on my brush, I will end up painting this onto the actual armor panel itself. So you only want, like I said, the top sort of quarter slash third of the brush to actually have any paint on it. And again, we've just gone completely past the detail in order to apply this. And I'm fully braced with my arms on my elbows on my chair and my forearms on the table and then I'm bracing myself on this model because it's a large large toy but I'm bracing my finger here but then if I was on a much slightly smaller model I would be holding this like this and I've got the model braced in my hand like this in the orientation in which I'm going to be painting it now in order to do that little curve at the bottom of the leg. I'm going to orientate the model slightly differently. And once again, I'm going to go past it and I'm going to pick out the edge like that. 
that. And then for the next bit along, which is this bit here, sometimes you might be inclined to do that with your brush. And this is going to be hard because the brush, the motion of your brush is going to take you onto the model unless you're super, super precise with it. So that is a much trickier highlight than say, turning the model once more to the side, bracing my hand now, and just once again, painting towards myself. So the same thing here, if I was to turn this model like this and try and do this edge, you can see how I've curled all the way around. My wrist is almost at a 90 degree angle. And because I need to watch out for this inner bit, I need to come even further like this in, the, in order to, I have absolutely no control here, over here. So what we are then going to do is we're gonna orientate the model all the way over. And we're gonna bring it round. And because we've got the paint at an acceptable level on the brush, you don't have to worry about the highlight being too thick or anything. We're always going just past it. We're orientating the model, so it's at a roughly sort of 90 degree angle to what we're painting. As you can see, we can then move through the rest of the detail. pretty quickly. By just consistently moving the model and always using our preferred comfortable brush strokes. Like that. So now, here we go. That's an entire Space Marine leg that's now been highlighted. However, sometimes you can't go past the detail too far. Instead, what you have to do is you want to take the paint, paint off until you've got a really nice, nice paint uh, tip on your brush. And so, for example, in here, you still want to angle the brush so that you're at that kind of that angle. And you want to only take the tip past it, the detail, because you don't want to kind of accidentally recess paint it and you just do want to do lots and lots of tiny little strokes but again as you can see I'm orientating the model so that I can have the most control by applying my paint towards me to get nice precise highlights. I'm going to do the same thing on the outside of it. Oop, we lost the base. Like that. Lovely stuff. And then you have the really tricky highlights, which do involve you almost drawing the paint onto the detail. So for example, 
we've got a very, very slight edge in here. So what you want to do here is you want to trace it with your brush so that you get familiar with the movement. And then again, you want to orientate the model. I'm using a much smaller brush here. That's because I want it to be perfect for you. There you go. And then the instinct here would be to do it this way. But again, you don't want to do that. You want to orientate the model. And you want to practice the brush stroke, just hovering above it. Make sure that you're ready. like that. And the beauty of doing edge highlights is it doesn't all have to be done in one brush stroke because you're not using contrast paints or anything like that. You're not worried about tie lines. You're just wanting to make sure you get it all the way around. And as you can see, even with a medium layer brush, I've done most of that apart from those last little edge around there. That is how, or at least the best way I can teach you how to do edge highlights. Were you on the edge of your seat the entire time? Terrible jokes aside, remember with edge highlighting, lots of little strokes and reorientating the model once again to make sure that it's a comfortable stroke that you can easily practice that downwards towards you stroke will improve your edge highlighting by a hundred thousand percent. I guarantee this. It's a war hipster guarantee. That's a thing now. Yes, those comfortable strokes are the best way to do those edge highlights. Make sure you angle the model roughly kind of in between sort of 35 and 90 degrees for your brush to do that edge, to just catch the edge. Make sure you go past those outside edges just so it's a lot easier for you to get that edge rather than drawing it in along something like an outside edge, for example, the Space Marine's leg plate. But for those inner ones, you will have to draw this. So practice the stroke, make sure your hand is used to that kind of motion of doing it and then gently apply it in lots of tiny little strokes. It's easier to do on a much bigger model of course and you can do lots more little strokes but you'll find that the more you practice this the bigger your strokes will get on the smaller more typical 32 millimeter models. So that's it guys a lot of theory a lot of talking and I hope you enjoyed this one and I hope you found it useful and I will continue to make these as and when I can find the time. And please let me know any more questions you have in the comments. That way I know what to base the next video around. So if you found this one useful, please once again do leave a like, comment below and subscribe to the channel. And let's keep talking about painting. I feel good and I'm back in the game. If you enjoyed this video, you love the channel, and you'd like to support me further, you absolutely can do so. Head to patreon.com forward slash warhipster, just like these bosses have done scrolling up on the screen before you, whose continued support helps me continue to make all the wonderful content that you enjoy. Alternatively, you could become a YouTube channel member by clicking on the join button on the channel page or just below this video like these wonderful, amazing people have done. And if you really like this video and you just want to shoot me a little thanks, you can click on the thanks button just below this video. Don't forget to share it, like it, comment on it, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. And to make sure you stay up to date, don't forget to click the bell icon. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you all very soon in the next one. 
happy wargaming.